DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with Tan Books, presents Put on the Armor, a manual for spiritual warfare with Dr. Paul Thickpen. Dr. Thickpen is an internationally known speaker, best-selling author, and award-winning journalist who has published 43 books in a wide variety of genres and subjects, including The Rapture Trap, A Catholic Response to End Times Fever, and The Manual for Spiritual Warfare, the book on which this series is based. In 2008, Dr. Thickpen was appointed by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to their National Advisory Council. He has served the Church as a theologian, historian, apologist, evangelist, and catechist in a number of settings, speaking frequently in Catholic and secular media broadcasts and at conferences, seminars, parish missions, and scholarly gatherings. Put on the Armor, a manual for spiritual warfare with Dr. Paul Thickpen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Paul, thanks once again for joining me. Chris, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. In this particular conversation, we're going to talk about the weapon of sacramentals. And in our previous discussion, we've talked about Scripture, about the incredible importance of prayer, the tremendous gifts we've had in the sacraments. But in this area of sacramentals, this seems to be the one thing that people, it kind, of, it kind of helps Catholics stand out in more ways than one, don't they? Well, it is. I mean, it's kind of, I think it's funny sometimes you look at old um, old movies that would have a, a, you know, whether it's something like a werewolf or a vampire, whatever, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the old the old style movies with the classic stories, it's always the sacramentals that come out to uh, to fight the evil. And uh, and I remember even before I became Catholic, I would think about that. You know, why do they always? Why is it always the sign of the cross that makes the vampire pull back, or the or the silver crucifix, or the holy water, or that kind of thing? And yet, the history of the Church demonstrates the experience of of Christians down through the ages is that the the very powerful prayer of the Church, which uh, becomes associated with sacramentals, um, is, is a very powerful weapon against the enemy. Well, let's begin at the beginning. What is a sacramental? Well, the Catechism of the Church describes sacramentals as sacred signs that bear resemblance to the sacraments. They signify or point to effects, especially of a spiritual kind, that are obtained through the Church's intercession. I'm kind of paraphrasing what it says here. Through sacramentals, the Catechism says, we are disposed to receive the primary effects of the sacrament. Sacraments, and they make various holy various occasions in life. So to kind of unpack that. Um, what I like to say is that uh, the sacraments are they're obviously they're not sacraments themselves, so they don't uh, convey the grace that they point to, that they signify the way sacraments do. But I like to speak of them as occasions of grace, just as we sometimes talk about occasions of sin, where uh, a situation we're placed into a situation where we are disposed or ex- exposed to sin. Uh, in this case, a sacramental. It can be a, uh, an action like a blessing or a rite, or it can be uh, an object. We'll go into some particular uh, some particulars of that. But either actions or objects that because of the prayer of the church that's connected to them, we are, we are disposed to the grace that comes to us from God, especially through the sacraments, that we are, it becomes an occasion of grace for us that we can take advantage of by our faith. And so the church has given us these, these sacramentals then, as uh, yet one more way of uh, making it even more, making the grace of God even more accessible to us. For those who are unfamiliar with what the term even right, a right means, let's talk about that briefly, just because I think it's it's something that many Catholics even are kind of hazy on, maybe because they, they haven't had the type of formation that they wish they had. Well, a, a right would be the in kind of a general sense, the formally designated by the church words and actions that uh, that, that are designated by the church for, I would say, for, for kind of a sacred purpose. Mm-hmm. So we have a it's, it's very close to the word ritual, um, but but it's more than ritual. Right usually means the the, the kind of ritual or ceremony as a whole and all the things that it signifies. So as a ritual, you could say, well, the rituals you do this. But if you speak of a, a rite of baptism, for instance, then you're talking about all the liturgy that uh, has to do with, uh, has to surround that that 
uh, right, that, that action of baptism, that sacrament of baptism. So it would be the words, uh, the gestures, so uh, they made probably signs of the cross and uh, blessings by the, the priest, and in the case of baptism, of course, both oil and water applied. Um, but you also have, uh, for instance, the rite of exorcism. And uh, the, everybody probably knows that word, you know, the, the, the church's formal authoritative uh, rite or ritual or ceremony by which uh, people are freed from the power of the enemy. And uh, a lot of folks don't realize that, that that rite, the rite of exorcism, is itself a sacramental. Paul, it's important for us to remember that with any rite of the church— including that of exorcism. It is something that the church has prayerfully, prayerfully discerned and discussed and provided for the people of God in such a way that the prayers and the structure are the very best pastoral encouragement response as we enter into the worship and the experience of that grace. Am I saying that properly? Oh, I th- you know, I think so. I, one of the things that um, struck me so much when I became Catholic was that I, I came from a tradition with a very um, kind of expressive, freewheeling kind of uh, worship. And it was, it was wonderful in a lot of ways, and I will always appreciate um, my experiences there and how much I learned about worshiping the Lord. But one of the things I came to appreciate so much about the Catholic tradition was the, the formal uh, nature of it. And, and when we say formal, we often think, okay, that means tuxedo and long gown. <laughs> but formal in the sense simply that, simply that it has a form. And that that form is something the church gives to us that we then make our own. Um, we, we put our hearts and our minds into it. And, and what I saw about that was that in our, you know, the tradition I came from, you would often have, uh, since everything was kind of so spontaneous, a lot of times there's certain things that, that were forgotten, certain things that were left out. So, for instance, in my tradition, we almost – I can't ever remember over many years our having, ever having a, any element of a church service where we corporately confessed our sin to God. And that's an important thing to do as a people. And so I began to see to, to, to see how the church really gives us a great gift in the liturgy and, and in the ritual and the rites that we have. Because as you say, she over years has, from the experience of so many Christians, I mean, some of it comes directly from our Lord, like this is my body, this is my blood, those Mm -hmm. words and that action. But others that surround it and and uphold it and uh, give it a framework and make it the grace accessible to us in so many ways, it's it's important because the the church's – her wisdom comes from 2,000 years of experience, that there are certain things that need to be included and not left out. That There are certain things that are best said with these particular words because they are precise. They have a special meaning, and if you just kind of paraphrase and use other words, you're losing that precision. There are certain things that we we are authorized to say, you might say, by by the church that because of the authority Christ gave to – to Peter and to the other apostles, and then through their representatives and their successors, that uh, that for instance the priest actually has the authority by his words and action to consecrate the bread and wine so that it truly does become the body and blood of our Lord. Now, not just anybody can do that. That's such an important part of having uh, the right, having the formal occasion, because if, if he even if the priest does it, but uses, you know, casually uses some other words, it, it doesn't happen. So the form is very, very important. It's a part of the authorized version. It's a, um, it helps us to know what is our part to do and what is the clergy's part to do. It helps us not to forget things like confession and other stuff that might not come to mind naturally. And in so many other ways, I could, you know, I could go on and on um, with the church calendar, the, the way the, the different rites of the year and the different um, liturgies of the year help us to, to get a fuller picture of, of salvation history and all the things that we need to appreciate, remember, and apply to our lives. I could go on and on because it, it means so much to me as a, as a convert to the church. I love the rites. Uh, as, having served as a liturgy director at several large parishes over the years, and you know, there is such a, a beauty in what the church has given us. You know, some th- some people I think may have the impression that it's it's extraordinarily rigid, 
and that it needs to be changed somehow. But it, it, when you dive into the right, you actually see that the presider, the one who has been chosen by the church to lead the particular services in which the right is being used, that there's many options for them to, to pastorally make certain decisions. I guess what I'm trying to say, Paul, it, it would be an act of hubris if we were to go in and say, well, I think I need to tweak this here, or tweak that there, or maybe the church doesn't get it, so I need to add some words. I mean, it, that, that would be kind of dangerous, wouldn't it? Yes, it is, and I've seen it done all too many times. But I, you know, And I've seen, for instance, uh, people paraphrasing Mm-hmm. Uh, what's given, and the words that they they paraphrase with it don't don't really mean what the original words mean. That's just one example. But we, um, I, I just I do love it so much. And and the truth is that there are certain times within the mass and with other rites too where where we're allowed to pray spontaneously internally, the, the mm-hmm. prayers of the faithful and other things. So it's it's not just the the form, but uh, but the truth is, you know, we're we're just in a period in in our culture's history where spontaneity and free form and you know do whatever you want to seems to be an idol and um, <clears throat> and we have to remember that and, and be grateful that the church who's been around for 2000 years recognizes that that along that direction lies chaos eventually that we need what i call anchors of prayer um they, they give us some room but they they hold us in place where we need to be so that we can get lost at sea somewhere it, the reason I, I've been emphasizing so much the importance of us appreciating the, the wisdom of how the church has compiled a right of the church, it, it really needs to be said in particular for the right of exorcism. It is one of those rights in which the church has been very thoughtful in its preparation, and it gives very particular guidelines for its use. And I think probably the key here, and we may have spoken about it in some of our other sessions talking, but is is the issue of authority. Mm-hmm. That um, I, I could, someone could hand me the, on paper, you know, the words uh, that are are said in an exorcism rite and the actions to be done. But I could get into really big trouble if I tried to do the exorcism using that, <laughs> because I I haven't been authorized. The, the authority to over the devil that Christ gave to St. Peter and the apostles that has come down then through them to their successors and to the ones that their successors appoint among the clergy is a very particular authority. And uh, although there, there are certain things that any believer can do, of course, in our battle against the enemy, if they weren't, I wouldn't have written the book I did. But, um, but this thing in particular, the, the right of exorcism is only for duly appointed exorcists. Um, and if we were to try to do that freelance on our own, we could get into really big trouble, just like the seven sons of, of Siva did in the book of Acts in the Bible. And if I'm not mistaken, it is the only rite of the church in which the the words that are contained and spoken by the priests are not directed to the Father in heaven or to us as lay people, but they are directly spoken to the demon. Yes, and that's that's one reason why we, we can't take it on ourselves to do it. <laughs> Again, with, without the proper authority, um, if we begin trying to talk, talk to demons, especially kind of on behalf of someone uh, for which we have no authority and responsibility, like our, our children, a family member, or ourselves, um, then it's like stirring up a hornet's nest, or it can be. Well, and not to to overemphasize the, the the harshness of that particular action, if we were to take that upon ourselves, but but to also emphasize the gift of it that in this this rite of exorcism, which is the sacramental of the church, we can turn as lay faithful to the church, to the priesthood, to be able to help us in this compassionate response to a, a healing from an assault. It's all like all these other gifts of the church. They are, they are uh, channels by which God gives us gr- his grace. And in this case, his mercy to um, his power, his, his authority to, to be freed from these things. It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. And it's, 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 again, it's very, because it is very powerful, you have to keep it in the right hands and done the right way. But when you think about it, that, that Christ has actually, after defeating the devil, after the Son of God defeated the devil, he has then given to human beings um, 
in in the proper setting with the proper authorization in the church he's he has given them a share in his power um that's an amazing thing to be able to overcome the enemy it is an area that has um our our understanding and our appreciation of has grown over the years and in particular over the last several years the united states catholic bishops adapted the language in a in such a way that it can be used more effectively by those exorcists and having approved that they've recently on their website provided a question and answer forum essentially to address certain questions about exorcism so this isn't something that needs to be hidden in a closet or anything like that but um, the bishops have taken it upon themselves to address certain issues and to kind of dispel some fallacies. Well, you know, because of Hollywood and uh, other sensationalist settings, <laughs> mm-hmm. exorcisms have, have certainly been um, been the subject of much speculation and misunderstanding, that kind of thing. So I, I think it's really important that they do answer questions and clear up misunderstandings. Um, because if you know if someone got their entire understanding of exorcism from Hollywood, they, they they would not be a very good understanding of what goes on. Paul, we've been primarily talking about major exorcism. There are minor exorcisms in the life of the church and in the rites of the church, aren't there? Yes, of course. There's um, the rite of infant baptism actually has uh, exorc- minor exorcism. There, the rite of Christian initiation of adults contains prayers of exorcism. There are also uh, minor exorcisms that a uh, a priest uh, can pray, use the words up to pray with uh, with a lay faithful. And that would not usually be done in, you know, within the context of a Eucharist, but sometimes within the context of confession or a counseling session. So there are uh, minor minor exorcisms as well. And any any priest, as I understand it, is, is uh, appointed, or normally at least a priest is a is authorized to do the minor exorcisms as well. And again, those are spelled out in the rites. There's a, a, a term we might not be familiar with called rubrics, and the rubrics kind of give the direction, kind of provide the parameters. The rubrics will definitively say this is a point where, for example, in the rite of confirmation, where it will say the bishop lays his hands on the the one who is seeking full communion, or the bishop ad- places oil on their forehead. It's very clear who the minister of that particular action is. That's right, because the you know, the words are critical. The particular words, the uh, the the so-called matter, if it's a sacrament, especially, but even in, in a sacramental, uh, the matter is important. If you're um, whatever actions and other things might be there. But then the third really important part is uh, is the authorized person to do it. So uh, all that has to be spelled out. A teaching from St. Augustine as found in the Manual for Spiritual Warfare, the snare of spiritual counterfeits. When I was still casting about spiritually, whom could I find to reconcile me to you, Lord? Was I to ask spirits for help? By what prayer? By what rituals? Many who strive to return to you, but are unable to do so on their own, have tried this path, I am told. They have fallen into a craving for strange visions, and they have been rewarded with delusions. Being arrogant, they sought you with a pride in what they learned, puffing out their chests instead of beating them in penance. And so, by a likeness in heart, they drew themselves to the demonic princes of the air, the conspirators and companions in pride. But they were deceived by those spirits through the power of magic. They thought they were looking for you, Lord, but they found the devil instead, who took on the appearance of an angel of light. Yeah, and that would be a sign for us if somebody or someone were to deviate 
from those rubrics, from those actions. That would be taking on an authority that they have not been given by the church. So we should be very leery of that if we ever were to encounter that somehow. Yes, I, th- I think so. There, uh, there are lots of self-appointed kind of exorcists out there. And uh, even some, you know, that would say that they're Catholic and, and plenty of them outside the Catholic Church. And I think we, we just have to be very, very wary of, of that kind of situation. One of the great sacramentals that we have, and maybe we take it for granted because we do it hopefully very often and during the course of the day, and, and that's the sign of the cross. That is, that's a huge, uh, incredible weapon that we have, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful? I, I love how uh, St. Athanasius in the early church wrote that before the coming of Christ, demonic powers used to deceive the pagans into worship, worshiping them and obeying their oracles. He says, but now, this is writing in the fourth century, but now since the divine appearance of the word, that is Christ, all this deception has come to an end. For by the sign of the cross, if a man will only use it, their deceptions are driven out. And you have St. John of the Enemy many centuries later talking about the sign of the cross as a terrible weapon against the devil. And that's why one reason why the church has images of the sign of the cross everywhere and, and why we make the sign of the cross. And think about why it, why it would be. It's um, When we make the sign of the cross, if we do it in faith, we are uh, kind of joining ourselves to the faith of the church and receiving the the benefits of the prayers of the church, and uh, and by way of that, we're receiving the benefits of the cross of Christ. And think about if, if you're a demon, what's the last thing you want to be reminded of or see? And that is the cross of Christ, because it was by that cross that you were crushed, by that cross that you were <clears throat> definitively defeated. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrifying thing to a devil to, to be in the presence of a cross that sign made by a believer in faith. And I've, I've heard it said by Monsignors who have celebrated 60 years or plus of priesthood that have said, all you have to do is just make a very heartfelt sign of the cross. And right there, that can be a, a moment of great liberation. And, and again, I can see why for the reasons we've said, I, uh, what, what better sign uh, sums up the faith of the church than the sign of the cross. If I mean, in a, in a way that's not verbal. Um, St. Paul, when he was preaching, he says, you know, I, I, I preach Christ and him, him crucified. That's what I preach. So one time when, on that occasion, he's trying to sum up, sum up the gospel, and that's how he does it, Christ and him crucified. So the, the sign of the cross is, is an image of, of all that we believe and all that we are and, and of our identity, identity in Christ, that he is the divine son of God who definitively defeated the devil, and we are in him. We are united to Christ. We are in him, and he is in us. And greater is he who is in us, the scripture tells us, than he who is in the world. So what better way? That No wonder why, you know, that since ancient times, when confronted with evil, the, the, the reflex of a Catholic Christian has been to make the sign of the cross. From the Manual for Spiritual Warfare In one of his sermons, St. John Vianney preached, The sign of the cross is the most terrible weapon against the devil. For this reason, the church displays images of the cross so that we can have it continually in front of our minds to recall to us just what our souls are worth and what they cost Jesus Christ. For the same reason, the church wants us to make the sign of the cross ourselves at every juncture of our day, when we go to bed, when we awaken, during the night, when we get up, when we begin any action, and above all, when we're tempted. Fill your children, my dear brethren, with the greatest respect for the cross, and always have a blessed cross on yourselves. Respect for the cross will protect you against the devil, from the vengeance of heaven, and from all danger. I have a very beloved family member who will also grab a, a a crucifix that she has around her neck 
and while many wear them as pieces of jewelry, and that's and that's a beautiful statement to the world, and it can be a lovely sign of the faith. There's something very powerful in in the crucifix, not only around someone's neck, but also on someone's wall. I mean, in 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 many uh, cases, there are many Catholic homes that have crucifixes in every room. I think we probably do in ours. <laughs> we do too. It's uh. And especially after some of the things I've seen <laughs> that make me want to have, uh, you know, that, that additional help uh, through the sacramentals of the church. But uh, again, it's um, no wonder in all the old vampire movies, you know, the uh, the person makes the sign of the cross and the vampire shrinks back. It's uh, again, it's Hollywood, but it, it's rooted in a certain kind of experience of the church. And that is that. Uh, the sign of making the sign of the cross and especially a crucifix in which our Lord is depicted, if it has been blessed by the church, it's not a sacramental if it hadn't been blessed by a clergyman. But if it is blessed, um, then it is a sacramental and it becomes that occasion of grace um, through which our joined to our faith, we have access to remarkable power through the prayers of the church. You've been listening to Put on the Armor, a manual for spiritual warfare with Dr. Paul Thigpen. To hear and or to download this episode along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. To obtain a copy of A Manual for Spiritual Warfare, go to tanbooks.com, the website for its publisher, Tan Books. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com in cooperation with Tan Books. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for Put on the Armor, A Manual for Spiritual Warfare with Dr. Paul Thickpen.